Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see everyone's smiling face. Um, thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. I'm really excited for today's uh, class with Freiling Sensei. And before I introduce him, um, as I did last week when I was before I introduced Ileana, I'd like to take a few minutes to thank everyone for writing to me. Uh, people have not been writing to me this much forever with all kinds of ideas and questions and you know it tells me you're really engaged and i love that that you're asking questions and and um, thinking through the themes that we're talking about so i really appreciate that so i'm going to try to keep this as contained as i can to like 10 minutes because i have two objectives there were two main buckets of questions that I can't really answer them in detail so briefly, but I'm gonna just kind of point the way and say, we'll come back to those questions because they're really quite substantial. And I'm gonna to try to answer them in such a way that also tees up Freiling Sensei, who will be talking about noticing the difference as applied to Otomo training in daily life. So the two buckets of questions, um, a lot on Sai Kon Tong, the book that so very much influenced uh, Toy Sensei, and then, uh, and, and its relationship to first order body-mind awareness. And the second bucket, interestingly enough, had to do with first order body-mind awareness and things like compassion or loving kindness. Um, and so I wanted to just uh, <clears throat> try to do an illustration of these things uh, in a way that will set up Otomo training. So this is a little risky on my part, but I'm going to try to do it. So as I've done the last couple of weeks, for people who haven't been here, I just want to remind you, first order body-mind awareness literally is when you are not projecting anything on the world. You're not analyzing, you're not judging, you're not thinking, you're try not trying not to think. In phenomenology, it's called thetically neutral, thetic, like a thesis. Your, your mind is not positing a thesis at all. That's what this first order body-mind awareness is. But on top of that, many times comes an occasion where you need to think, you need to respond to the environment. So I'm going to use an illustration. Uh, I'm gonna to read to you just one epigram from uh, Sai Kon Tong because it illustrates uh, a couple of points here that I wanna discuss. And I, and I think just having an illustration will help you. Later on, you can go back and I would say, read Shokushu number seven, because you're gonna find that the, the, the passage I'm gonna to read to you from Sai Kon Tong are the seeds, in fact, of living calmness in the Shokushu. So here's, here's how it, it reads. Oh, I also said that Toy Sensei probably never taught a class without referring to Sai Kon Tong in some way. But he didn't say, now I'm gonna talk about Sai Kon Tong he would just use these references and people would think, wow, he's, he's so smart. He's, he's, he's uh, talking about this kind of classical literary tradition because Sai Kon Ton was written in Chinese. And so um, the earlier Chinese, and, and remember language, written language was imported from China. So this is, this is a very big deal in terms of intellexia in Japan. So in any event, Sai Kon Ton was a very, very popular work quoted often, especially by Toy Sensei, who pretty much memorized the whole thing. Uh, I know that because he was, writing, he was writing these passages in his diary when he was in the military in China, and his commanding officers were like, whoa, this is so high level, you are so smart. In any event, let me just give you a taste. When the wind blows through the scattered bamboo, they do not hold its sound after it is gone. When the wild geese fly over a cold lake, it does not retain their shadows after they have passed. So the mind of the superior person begins to work only when an event occurs and it becomes void again when the matter ends. What that means is this is what when Toy Sensei says, if you're living your life with mind and body unified, you're living the base in a first order mode. 
But then because, and he would call this genjo or presencing. Genjo means to be present, like shimpo uchure kan no soku genjo, which is at the shomen of the Tenshin Gosho in Japan, or when we do kiire, kibarai with a blessing. That last word, genjo, is the same thing. It means to be present. You're not thinking, you're not, think, not thinking, you're just being present. And then an event occurs and you respond. That's what happens in ethics too. So let me just try to give you an example. 44 years ago, in 1976, was my first opportunity to Otomo for Toy Sensei. We were, I had just moved to Honolulu. Uh, he knew me before as the ski racer from the West Coast that always took Uzuke during seminars. And suddenly he's there in Honolulu at the Palama Dojo, where we had, by the way, in one dojo, three six dons and one fifth don. Tabata sensei, Eto sensei, Yamamoto sensei, and Naloi sensei, all in the Palama dojo. And Toy sensei's there, he sees me. And I, I begin taking his okay during the class and he actually asked if I could drive him, like I wasn't assigned to be the Otomo, but he asked to spend time with me and he asked if I would drive him from the Palama Dojo to uh, the Pagoda Hotel, uh, which is right next to his favorite restaurant, the Leaky Leaky Drive-In. Anyway, so I'm like shocked. And, he, and, he, and I was this event, like here he is Toy Sensei, and suddenly some event, just like in Sai Kong Tong, comes up. And he goes, the event is, wait, why are you here? You're supposed to be in California. You're the ski racer. And I said, well, Sensei, I wanted to continue my training. And so I moved here to Honolulu, where I can also go to graduate school at the University of Hawaii. And he was like, why daigaku? Honto? I said, yes. What are you studying? I said, Asian philosophy. He looked at me like, Asian philosophy? Yeah. I said, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism. I told him what my courses were that term. I was studying with Jung Yuan Zhang, of course, in Chan Buddhism, the precursor of Japanese Zen. And then I was studying early Buddhism with the world's greatest authority on the early Buddhist text, the Pali Nikayas. His name was David Kalupahana. I told Toy Sensei this, and he was like absolutely fascinated. This ski racer that I know from one part of the world is now in Honolulu. He's training, and he wants to understand my thinking more deeply by understanding uh, Asian philosophy. I said, yes, Sensei. Well, when I said Confucian, Taoism, and, and Buddhism, he looked at me and laughed and he just said, Sai Kong Pong. <laughs> because if you know that text, it is an amalgamation of all three and something that Toy Sensei really, um, well, it influenced him more than anything else by far. And so, at that moment, when he started asking me questions, I felt this kind of compassion, loving kindness, just sincere interest, like he was emptying himself wholly and then encouraging me to ask questions in response, in kind. And I just thought, whoa, this is Toy Sensei and he's giving me this time and attention. He's being fully present with me and interested in my mind. And he was fascinated that I would take this step to move to Hawaii, enroll in the University of Hawaii Graduate School, because I wanted to understand his mind more deeply. Well, he just like, from that day forward, boom, fall 1976, we had a connection that was really driven by him, that he really was fascinated by that. This is what he loved to study and read in his life, not the, his economics classes at KO University. You've heard me talk about that before. In any event, I was on the receiving end of what I felt was just this incredible focus and attention, deeply listening to me and offering himself up, encouraging me from that day forward to ask him questions that if I made the effort to move to Hawaii, go to school, to study his mind, he was going to reciprocate. And it was just incredible. Little acts of kindness. I'll be uh, quicker. I think I've told this story to some of you before, but let's just say I'm Otomo 
for him and we're out at a restaurant. He, re he thinks I need to gain weight, like Matthew Atarian now. He thinks I'm losing weight and I need to eat more. So what does he do? He directs people's attention away from his plate by, by just extending key this way and everyone's turning their head. And when they're doing that, he's taking food from his plate and moving it silently, invisibly, like he's otomoing for me, putting food on my plate again and again and again. No one's noticing, but no one's gonna let Toy Sensei's plate become empty, like in a sushi place, right? It's just gonna keep coming. And he, it comes and it goes to me, it comes and it goes to me. Loving kindness. Or during a demonstration, another illustration I mentioned to uh, Kaicho Sensei once. For a while there, he wouldn't use Kaisho, Gyosho, Sosho. He'd talk about techniques as spring, that would be Kaisho, summer, Gyosho, fall, Sosho. And then winter is what he called demonstration style. Like he was trying to make a point, trying to show the, the power of this. And obviously he's not gonna throw uh, someone who he thought might hurt themselves too hard. So he would just like, look at me, like I'm okay, he's Nage, look at me. And under his breath, he'd go, winter. Like, watch out. I'm gonna do winter. I don't want to hurt you. Be prepared. Get on your game because now we're really going to do some things. But see, that was an act of kindness. He was like warning me, saying, you know, dude, get on your game here because I'm going to I'm going to be going now. Another act of kindness. Uh, last one. It was 1993 Maui. And I, I guess Suzuki Sensei had asked me to Otomo for uh, Tohei Sensei. And uh, on that trip, uh, and so I was there at the hotel with him uh, after training. He took a little nap, and he asked me to wake him up at a certain time, more time than usual, because he was going to put on his formal kimono. Uh, because I had to carry Suzuki Sensei's Hachidan certificate, because he was going to be awarded Hachidan that night, and it was a surprise to Suzuki Sensei. So I know that I'm Otomo, I gotta help him get dressed, but he's got this formal kimono and his luggage, it's coming in like wooden boxes, like really old classic, like antique, like shipping crates. And it's got wooden dividers in it. And I, and I was like, so apologetic. I was like, Sensei, I don't, know, I don't know how to help you. I don't know how to do this kimono. <laughs> and I, I was really nervous and he looked at me and he said, uh, Daijobu this. He said, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to do it either. Let's figure it out together. So apparently either his wife or you know, someone in Japan when he was getting ready to put on all these different layers would help him. So he didn't know either. And it was like, it just broke, it broke the ice. It was just such an act of kindness to just say, you know what, let's, let's figure it out together. Um, anyway, all that is to say, being an Otomo, he was Otomoing for me, but it was supposed to be the other way around. His mind is like this. And when an event arises, the wind goes across the bamboo, the geese fly across the, full, the, the, the frozen lake, but then they're gone. And when they're gone, don't be stuck. As Kaicho Sensei says, let your mind be free. We're, we're training to be free of attachment. Each of these subject object things that we're focused on has the potential to create a form of stuckness in our training. So um, with, that, with that large introduction, I, I want to say that this, what we've been talking about seeing with an expanded periphery is what Toy Sensei was doing all the time. And then he would react as, as he's presencing the situation. Uh, Genjo, again, he's reflecting the moon and the flying bird. So his mind is like the scattered bamboo, the frozen lake. So these are all word pictures to help us understand what is the mind that the author of Sai Kon Ton was trying to help us to understand and why was it so influential? So this might just be a fun for some people just to get inside Toy Sensei's thinking more deeply. I was passionate about it and 
And that pretty much defined our relationship. So in life, you might ask yourself, you know, what, how would my life be different if a certain influential person didn't come into your life? In my case, I, I literally can't imagine what my life would be like without studying Ki Aikido from Toy Sensei and all the other senseis that helped me to learn and continue to learn. So in Rich's case, there's a person that I think has that role. And it's not me. It's not like I'm his, you know, uh, well, I am his teacher, but a gentleman by the name of Jim Henderson. So, so let me briefly, uh, Rich, sorry I'm taking up your time here. Rich has been training now. He's in his 32nd year since he started training with me at Furman University in the academic year 1988-89. So he graduated uh, in 1992, and much to his parents' chagrin, I was like in trouble there for a while, they said, okay, we just paid for this elite, private, liberal arts education with high tuition, and what are you gonna do now, son? And he says, well, I kind of majored in Aikido, and I'd like to keep training. So I'd like to stay in Greenville, and he got a job with one of our instructors, Bob Ripley, who's a master woodworker, and so Rich, basically, in order to eat and have a job, he learned under Bob Ripley, and he, his life was in the wood shop, learning how to make shoji screen for the dojo and things like that. And, and then we had a student come along. His name was Jim Henderson, just happened to be the founder of Henderson Advertising, which was a behemoth of an advertising company that would routinely steal annual awards from Madison Avenue advertising houses right down here in little old Greenville, South Carolina. Well, Jim started training maybe when he was 70 already, and he took a liking to Rich, who was, you know, teaching classes, and Rich took a liking to Jim, and they would train privately. Well, Jim took a liking to Rich so much so he said, you know, what do you, what do you want to do? You know, I'd like to hire you. And Rich is like, what? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to train you to be an account executive at my firm. Long story made short, he hires Rich. Rich gets on the biggest um, client, Dow Brands. He becomes an assistant account executive, which by the way is like an Otomo I learned over the years. Because what does the account executive do? You're the face to the client. So let's say Dow Brands, the business people, they're looking for marketing and advertising. And he's the guy, the business guy, that's gonna work with them. But someone has to be the go-between between the business people and the creatives at the advertising firm. They're all artists. They're all like out-of-the-box thinkers. They're not the one that's gonna actually negotiate the deal. So it's like you're a broker between the client and the creative. And Rich was like, I, I think he's masterful at it because it's just good interpersonal skills and listening. And this is what Jim Anderson saw. When Dow Brands moved to Minneapolis, Jim, I think loving Rich to help him out as a person, said, let me help you. You need to move to New York. 1995, I think, if I get my dates right. Um, yeah, Rich moves to New York. He gets a job with Gray Advertising. He becomes an account executive and he just starts working his way up. First account, huge. Procter and Gamble, GlaxoSmithKline, Kimberly Clark, Johnson and Johnson, Major League Baseball, uh, the PGA, Professional Golf Association. Rich has been the dude uh, in his career and he's, he's too humble to tell you that, but I can just tell you. He, he spent four years in Europe as the managing director of Europe Online, came back just after 9-11, uh, was rehired at Gray because they thought he was a superstar, which he was, um, and basically continued there. He, he started as the head instructor in New York. Uh, well, he got married in 2003, head instructor in 2005, became a father in 2007. And then finally in 2014, he decided to form his own consulting company, like an advisory firm in marketing and also doing leadership uh, ex uh, seminars for, for businesses. So 
you know, I'm just blessed. We heard from Patrick Terry, 29 years, a student, uh, Ileana, 27 years, Rich, 32 years, and that's, that's not even as much as Harold Sensei and Stone Sensei. So to have this kind of relationship with my students um, and, and many more in EKF, it's just that I didn't know, know you that well that early since we started EKF in 2004. Um, so in any event, uh, it's really my pleasure to ask Rich to simply share whatever he's going to share, but I think it has something to do with Okom Otomo and seeing and, and applying key in daily life, especially where we are right now. So apologies for taking 20 minutes. Uh, I wanted to get back to you. Thank you, Sensei. Um, so bear with me because I'm also recording and I just want to make sure that I, uh, I'll mute myself in the right video. Anyway, um, I think this is a huge opportunity and I'm so thankful, uh, Sensei for, you know, being able to lead a discussion around Otomo training. Um, in no way do I profess to be an expert. I, um, if you want to see a real expert, find Harold Sensei somewhere in your screen and give him a wave because when you watch Harold Sensei Otomo, you get a much greater clarity on how difficult it is and how effortless it can look. And so I was very fortunate to um, watch Harold Sensei Otomo through the years and sort of extract all those best practices myself. So I don't profess to be an expert, but I have been very lucky to have had opportunities to Otomo for um, some wonderful teachers. Of course, Shana Sensei being the, the main one. It's a skill that can always be improved on and Shana Sensei reminds me of that um, on multiple occasions. So what I wanna do is, I know that our worlds are upside down right now and we are all living in close quarters. Uh, our houses probably feel much smaller. We're on top of each other. We can't really get away. Maybe we're losing patience a little bit more easily. We're crabby, we're short, we're dismissive. The stress is high. In my world, um, I have a new set of clients that I can no longer see anymore. That's stressful. I have two teenage boys that all of a sudden their world, their, the rug got pulled out from under them and they don't have their friends anymore. And they're trying to figure out how they survive in this world of social distancing. I have a wife who is an opera singer. She's an artist. And the whole world of the arts has completely blown up and it is um, no longer essential. And, uh, and that's difficult for her. I have aging parents that, I can't see, but I still need to look after. Um, I have a mother-in-law who's a challenge unto herself, but same thing, she's aging and I need to continue to look after her. I have a community of friends that I wanna be a part of, but I need to do it in a virtual way. Uh, I have a best friend who um, is basically furloughed from the Metropolitan Opera and he doesn't know when he's gonna go back to work. It could be two years, he is without income. And I'm trying to be a best friend to him. So there are, and I'm sure we all have in our life, we all have these challenges and we're all trying to juggle being the best we can be given what we're dealing with and being meaningful and relevant and important in other people's lives. So when I look back on everything that I've learned in Aikido training and when the times get tough, like they are now, the one skill that I keep coming back to is the skills that have been reinforced in me through Otomo training. Although I love Joe One and I can get really excited about doing Taigis, it's Otomo training that I think offers me some of the most fundamental and important principles in, in these sort of times. If you don't mind, I wanna share my screen because there's some slides that I wanna show. Let me know if you can see this. Can you see this screen? Everyone good? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. So I want to first dispel a myth about Otomo training. It is not like what this picture might suggest. This is not some indentured servant 
like, you know, holding the gown of a king walking down an aisle. You know, even though you might see an Otomo pour beers and, you know, give plates of food and open doors and, you know, be a chauffeur, drive, it is not just a physical act of service. There's so much more. And thank you, Shannon Sense, for giving that story in the beginning because Otomo training is not just a one-way street. Really, the gift of Otomo training is a deeper sense of training, but the gift flows the other way where the sensei is also giving an unbelievable amount of service to the Otomo himself. There is a, an incredible relationship there. And I want to, in, in the next few minutes, try to dimensionalize what Otomo training is and how it can apply to daily life and how, how complex and, and, and deep and meaningful this training is. It is not anything like this picture. In fact, if, if this is a myth of Otomo training, I wanna make sure I dispel it in, in this discussion. So I have been trained in advertising and um, when you're trained in advertising, you always like to think in three buckets. And I want to try to offer three buckets and organize my thoughts in terms of Otomo and daily life. The first um, bucket that I want to sort of bring to life, defining Otomo training, is this bucket of connection. Um, in, the, in the book, Shainer Sensei wrote, Living with the Wind at Your Back, uh, he wrote about Otomo training. You must pay attention constantly to every interaction and every nuance. However, you must do so without staring and without causing people to be uncomfortable. Um, in other words, I think you need to have a, wise, a wide gaze. And, and Shannon Sensei also mentioned this in the beginning of this talk. You need to notice things without having tunnel vision. You know, like when I think about when I'm, Shannon Sensei is Otomo and we're starting a new seminar, um, the first thing I, I try to notice as I walk into the dojo for the first time are just like, I, again, I'm not trying to stare at anything. I'm just trying to notice, is there a shokushu? Is there water? Are there chairs for the senior instructors? Um, are the reading glasses available for Shannon Sensei? You know, his files that he likes to have by the showman, you know, is there a whiteboard, pen and erasers? You know, you, you don't want to make the guest dojo uncomfortable by not having those things available, but you also want to anticipate the needs of Shana Sensei as he does that. So again, I think this is wonderful that you're trying to notice every nuance, but you don't want to make people uncomfortable and, you know, bring attention in that way. Uh, so it's paying attention, but not staring. Now, what this means, th th what's interesting is that you're trying to notice every interaction and every nuance. And that sounds a lot like third order body-mind awareness. Like you could imagine, you know, trying to notice everything, but not let it command all your attention. And I think one of the beautiful things about Otomo training is that it really does force you to enter in to a, a second order mindset, a body mindset, which means that you are noticing things, but you're not being attached to them. Whereas all of a sudden, all the other things which you need to pay attention to go away. You have to make sure that you're seeing everything, including your, your teacher and making sure that he is front and center, but you also need to have that, that peripheral. I think um, when, when we were training in Japan, I remember Ohara Sensei telling the story. He's like, imagine you are, you know, in combat, there's two of you and you have live blades and you're facing off with each other and your focus is 100% on your opponent. But if you can't hear the birds in the background, then you're dead. And I think it's a wonderful story that says, you need to be focused in what's in front of you, but you also need to have complete awareness of what's going on. 
in order to perform at your, at your highest level. Another, um, I think, really important part of connection as it relates to being Otomo is being able to listen well. And there's a great book, I'm sure a lot of you have read it. It's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he goes through uh, the five levels of listening. And they're so, they're so great because I think you'll appreciate them, especially now as we're all sort of living in close quarters together. The first level of listening is classic. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about is ignoring. So you know, and you can hear something going on in another room that's just not good, but you're going to ignore it because hopefully it'll go away. You don't want to address it. You're just going to ignore. I mean, that's sort of level one. Uh, it's like a parental defensive mechanism. Um, the second level is faking. You know, imagine you're having a conversation or, and, and you're just sort of saying, uh-huh, yeah. I mean, you know, again, we're all parents and that three-year-old that's just talking, 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 and you're just saying, uh-huh, I get it. Okay, yes, yes, yes. So faking is another level of listening. And that third level is selective listening. And, and that's what we all do when we're in those long conference calls uh, in business. And we're just listening to the conversation and if we hear something that is relevant to us or spikes our interest, then we lean in a little bit more. So it's very selective in terms of what we're actually listening to. Um, the fourth level I think is fascinating. And this is something I think it's always nice to pay attention to is autobiographical listening. So imagine you're having a conversation with someone and you ask them, hey, you know, what are you doing during your, you know, shelter in place? And all of a sudden they, they start talking about, hey, you know, I'm actually uh, writing, uh, you know, a, a book. And all of a sudden you start saying, oh, well, I, I'm writing a book too. And, and basically what you've done is you've completely taken over that conversation. You've made it autobiographical. So even though you're listening to them and they say something that's interesting, you have basically steered the conversation back to yourself and, I, and that happens a lot um and it's it's always interesting to you know keep you know be mindful of that the last level of listening is uh, empathy uh and empathetic listening and you know empathetic listening is that fifth level of listening where you are truly 100 percent vested in um listening to another person and I think that's a level of listening that, you know, when it comes to Otomo training and connecting deeply with someone, that's a level of listening that, um, that I think uh, is, is most meaningful. Uh, so that's the first bucket uh, is um, connection. Uh, second bucket I want to share with you uh, is uh, rhythm and not uh, again you've 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 heard this a lot especially in Aikido training um, we train rhythm a, a lot and one of the components of rhythm as it relates to Otomo training is don't be late and I think you know when you think about some of the drills we do in Aikido uh, we you know, like any sort of irimi, when you're attacking like a shomenuchi irimi or yokomenuchi, uh, and the art is an irimi art, you, we actually do these drills where you're saying now, not when they start to physically raise their hand, but when you feel their key. And so you're moving on, on key extension. And again, Shana Sensei brings this up in his book, um, and he says, this training has a cumulative effect of training you to see things clearly through your extension of ki and not through physical eyes only. If you were to only see things in otomo training, physical things, then the chances of you being late are much greater. In fact, you'll be late every time if you're only taking your cues based on physical movement you really do need to extend yourself completely and feel 
key in order to, to then move accordingly. And I think that's, again, you know, the, that is rhythm. Understanding rhythm through key movement, not physical movement, is huge. My, um, my father is, um, is getting older and he's having a lot of problems moving. And um, at the beginning of the, the pandemic, uh, they were in South Carolina. This is like in early March. And my mom was really worried because my father couldn't really move well and she needed to basically drive the 12 hours from South Carolina back up to New Jersey. And she's like, Rich, I really, I need some help on this one. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna fly down. I fly one way into Charleston and um, I pick them up and we begin driving. And it was such a wonderful opportunity for me to Otomo for my father because he was not able to do the things. He's a very proud man. And even though his mind is 100%, his body is maybe at like 10% of what it used to be. So I had to not have him ask. He doesn't want to ask. He's a proud man. He's not going to ask for something. But if you extend yourself and feel his key, you can anticipate his needs. And so, you know, we had to stop a lot. I had to get out the walker. And because of the COVID threat, you know, you want to make sure that he's not touching anything and you have to wipe things down. You have to make sure there's enough, you know, breaks and, and he has water and food and he's comfortable in the car. You know, he needs to stretch a little bit more. The bathroom breaks were really important because again, he's not going to ask to go to the bathroom, but you need to pick up cues. Is he squirming in his seat a little bit? And there was something deep, for me in that relationship. And I called on all those Otomo skills during, during that time. Shannon Sincere writes in his book, moving on the end of, or, you know, we train a lot moving on the end of now. And, and that is probably the most critical thing is, is being, being early. Uh, another quote from Shannon Sensei is, in order to anticipate needs effectively, you must have the patience necessary to allow a person's actions to direct your uh, responses. And when I think about the word that Shannon Sensei used in that uh, patience, I think that so perfectly summarizes what we need in this time. We need patience. We need empathetic listening. Um, it is a required skill in this new world. And, and I think that is how we're going to get through this. And it's an opportunity to use this as, as real training. The um, third bucket is service. And I think, you know, if Shinichi Toy Sensei was here, he would say this is the um, change your concept. Part. This is the, the secret sauce. This is how you take Otomo training. And when you, when you talk about connection and rhythm, it almost sounds like these are criteria for Aikido exams. In fact, they exactly are criteria for Aikido exams. Connection is a key criteria for Shodan and um, rhythm is a key criteria for Nidan. But all of a sudden, when you, when you put on service, you have fundamentally changed the concept of training. Because imagine this, imagine you are doing an Aikido technique and you're doing all the right things in terms of connection and you're doing all the right things in terms of rhythm, but you change your concept and you are now performing the Aikido art as an art of service. How, imagine conducting an Aikido art, serving your uke. What, how do you think that would impact your level of connection? How would it impact your level of rhythm? It would likely just exponentially make that a more meaningful and incredible experience between, between the nage and uke. 
Shane Sissi writes also in his book that this is the practice of the art of service. This is Otomo training to learn and direct your needs and desires in the services of others. I, I love this word redirect um, because sometimes when people describe, you know, what is Aikido, they oftentimes describe it as, oh, I'm redirecting the power of this person and I'm redirecting it back to them. And, you know, it's, it's sort of a simple explanation of what Aikido is. Um, even though, you know, people may never have trained Aikido, they can sometimes describe it that way. And, and you know, I guess it, in some reason that's, that's, you know, it's accurate to a point. But how deep is it to think that, that really the, this deep practice of, of service is you're redirecting your needs. I'm not redirecting the power of my partner. I'm redirecting my needs into the service of others. And I think that is, I think that is profound. And, you know, I'm reminded that you know, we're redirecting our spirit into service and I'm redirecting all my desires. I'm redirecting all my needs into the service of someone else. And, you know, I think of the, I think the Japanese is, you know, what is Zenshin no Jakata o Kanzen Ninuku, right? So you're taking all your Zenshin, all your power, and you're basically throwing it away. And I guess this idea of redirecting your own needs and desires is this idea of throwing away yourself. If, if this really is the art of selflessness, then you are throwing away yourself. You're throwing away all your power and you're, you're directing that into the service of others. And I think, again, as we think about what is Otomo training and how is it a deeper level of training, it brings to life this, this thought of what is true relaxation, what is, what is truly relaxing completely. And, and if relaxing completely is throwing away all your power, then the art of Otomo, the art of service, is exactly that same thing. You're throwing it away, you're redirecting it into the needs of others. And again, I, I, I find that deep and meaningful training at a time where I think it is incredibly, um, incredibly important. Uh, there is um, a book that I find really, really interesting and meaningful um, in business. And it's a book by Simon Sinek called Leaders Eat Last. And in this book, he talks about leadership today is probably different than it was, you know, generations ago. You know, the, the CEO's responsibility is not to be served by the employees. The, the jobs of the employees is not to serve the CEO, but rather the other way around. The CEO, his job is to serve the employees. It's completely different. And you can tell organizations that don't have that new way of leadership, they often find themselves in trouble. And Leaders Eat Last is, is something Simon Sinek got from the military. He uh, was, was studying the military and how they worked. And he noticed that when it was time for chow, that the leaders, in the military would always wait for everyone else to be fed before they would, they would feed. And it underscored the basic principles of service, which is you are not taking care of yourself, but your responsibility is for the person on your left and for the person on your right. And by that very definition, you will be taken care of. And it's not that you have to fend for yourself. This is not about me. This is about other people helping other people. This is about the art of service. Shainer Sensei and I have um, an opportunity a couple times a year to work with the students of the Citadel. And one time we were working 
um, and it was like in the summer months in Charleston, South Carolina, and it was excruciatingly hot. I mean, we're talking, you know, it was probably in the hundreds, low hundreds. And they actually put a black flag up. A black flag means like, hey, you guys need to chill out, you need to take water breaks. You, you can't run from the different stations. And the training that we do with the Citadel students, it's divided up into different um, stations. And we're just one station. We give Aikido training and principles of mind-body in one station. But the other stations in which they're working are these highly active physical fitness and they're just smoking these kids just making them go through these courses and these kids are exhausted because they start at five in the morning they don't end until seven at night and it was lunchtime and i remember distinctly i was fascinated by this that um it was lunchtime the kids were tired and they were hungry but there weren't enough meals uh, and they were handing them out and they discovered oh we messed up we messed up the order and sure enough, the, the commandant, the, the main guy, the leader, was, took it upon himself to make sure that he would go find more lunches. And he would hand them out individually to every student uh, that didn't have them, every kid. And he didn't assign someone else to do that. It, it was a very physical task that someone else could have done easily, but he felt responsible and he was servicing them in a way that was within their their code of behavior and it again it brought to life to me that eaters do in fact eat last um, and that that really to me expressed true leadership um, one one more thing I wanted to touch on uh, as we round out sort of this bucket of service. And, and it's, I think, one of the you know, most important parts. Um, as we talk about Otomo training is the art of selflessness and your aim is to be invisible in your selflessness. Um, you know, I talked about Harold Sensei and his ability to Otomo in a way that's you don't even see him. I mean, he's just, it's like he's there and not there. It's, 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 it's such a wonderful thing to watch if you've ever seen it. And it always comes from a very common place. And the place from which it comes is uh, shokshu in toku, good done in secret. To do good in secret means to act without seeking attention and praise and to act without hope of reward. I think you know, as we get to practice Otomo in daily life, it's coming back to this key saying over and over again, and to provide a service that is not something that you would ever expect to get back. You're doing it in a selfless way. You're doing it in an invisible way. Um, and I think that is just such an important part of training. So I, um, shared everything I wanted to share. And uh, Shannon Sensei, I can open this back up to you if you have any comments, but um, we can also take um, questions. I just wanna say thank you very much. That was a, a marvelous uh, presentation. And obviously you took a lot of time and attention to, to prepare it in an organized uh, way. So I'm just really yeah. grateful. Uh, if you were to, uh, Rich, uh, reflect on first order body mind awareness, you know, I, I was kind of suggesting that this is how Toy Sensei lives. That's his normal. And then he responds. When an event occurs, he responds appropriately and then goes back to first order. He's just, that's, that's his base. And so second and third order is what com comes out of that. Um, we've talked a the last couple of weeks about this expanded periphery, whether you're able to sustain a second order experience without tunnel vision and it's expansive. Um, have you ever had um, an experience where, um, what, what shall I say, the connection with another person 
seem to evidence for you the same characteristics of first order, which is just racation. It's, it's when Toy Sensei says, you will experience that you are the universe and the universe is you. It will lead you to the supreme ecstasy of experiencing for yourself that you are one with the universe. Does anything come to mind with respect to otomoing or anything else with respect to that? I mean, my, my experience with Otomo has been fighting not to be in third order. Um, and when I can really focus on you and I do it in a way that I feel like I've attained a second order, then I feel that I'm able to, my peripheral expands. I'm not, I don't have tunnel vision and I can see things, including your ability to, to move on the end of now. So I can, I feel like I can do that. The degree to which that second order experience flips into first order, I'm not sure. I know like when I breathe in the morning, I, I feel like sometimes I can flip into that first order because all of a sudden everything goes away. But there's something about being Otomo that you are still, I don't know, there's still a connection. There's still that thetic positing that you are, yeah. you know, that you're, you're yeah. still there. Yeah, that was, I'm glad you said that. That was, that was kind of where I was going to. It's like your role is to be purposefully mindful of a specific task. So that task you can't let go of. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, there are people on the call, uh, Nathan was recently otomoing uh, with me in, in Russia, um, Patrick and you recently in, in Japan, uh, John Popoli and Matt Deutsch Kidder have also uh, otomoed for me uh, in Russia and Europe, Harold Sensei uh, in Russia and Europe. So I'm just curious, uh, for other people who have had some significant international travel in Otomo. Do you have any comments or questions for Rich or things to add from your own perspective? Hey, everybody. Um, uh, Frowling Sensei, what you said about service uh, really uh, resonates with me and it's a, a great reminder. Uh, I find, or I, I, I feel like I learned a lot about this in Russia, but uh, the more I'm able to remember that this experience of being Otomo is something that I should be deeply grateful for, uh, the easier it is for me to, um, to remain, stay away from the, the third order awareness, um, from, to stay away from the monkey mind uh, that's just gonna uh, you know, make, make it a worse experience for everybody. Um, and so remembering that it's about service, remembering that um, it's an opportunity that is, uh, should be just really relished, um, made it a more enjoyable experience. I think probably in both directions uh, helped me learn much more and, and helped me have the proper perspective and awareness. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment or a question for Rich? We'll pick it up again. I wanted to yes. also, um, Leslie Mills, you had a, um, a question. Do you want to, do you want to chime in there? Uh, sure. I've, um, I've struggled with the question of Otomo largely because I was trying to figure out how to relate to it in a way that wasn't like that cartoon that you shared of like carrying the, the King's cape. Um, and so much of what you were describing sounded to me more like what I would think of as just um, radical hospitality uh, <laughs> rather than rather than servitude. Um, and so I was just curious if you might say anything along those lines. I mean, uh, Shannon, since you, you know, you can jump in here too. I, I think hospitality is a component of servitude, you know, in every shape, way, and form. I think where the art of service goes deeper is 
what you are doing with yourself. In other words, you are putting aside your ego to make room for all the gifts that a teacher can, can give. And believe me, if you don't allow room for that, you're not going to get it. You're not. It's just, there's not, there's not nowhere for it to go. There's no pores for it to sink in. And I think, I think that is one of the most important parts is to just remove yourself from the equation so that all that great stuff can get in at a very deep level. Um, I was going to ask uh, Harold Sensei, since he's been referenced here numerous times, whether he might have a comment. Um, he's, he uh, is a genius at finding the minimum amount of words to make the point. <laughs> so I've heard him in the past say, you know, when people get confused about Otomo, they're definitely in third order. And they're going through this whole list of all the do's and don'ts that someone told you you have to do. And it just makes you like lose it. And so Harold Sensei said, you know, it's real simple. Just put yourself in the place of the other person. End of story. So uh, do you want to comment on that, Harold Sensei? Uh, um, that pretty much sums it up. I. I, I <laughs> I, I've never heard anyone uh, use the word servitude uh, when, um, or, or I've never, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I've never, <clears throat> my internal voice has never used the word servitude. Um, it, it, service is not a bad word. Um, I, I try to serve uh, my fellow men and women in the world and children. I serve my family. Um, many of us are in um, the, uh, are in service field. So, so um, I guess I don't really understand um, what the, um, what, why um, we, we apply a negative pejorative to, to um, Otomo training. Um, it, it, in one way, you can view it as the most selfish of acts because you get to learn the most, uh, because you get to be the closest. Um, that's not a very positive way of looking at it. Um, to me, it's essential to Aikido training because it is exactly that. It's, it's ultimately putting yourself in the place of another person. And that's um, one of our primary principles. So um, that was not nearly as few words as I would like to use. Uh, but um, so maybe, maybe um, as um, uh, Kaicho Sensei is uh, fond of saying, we need to change our concept. Uh, about what is Otomo training. Yeah, excellent. Well, we, um, we're up against the hour, everyone. Um, I wanted to note that for the last three classes, we kind of titled these, you know, uh, noticing the difference, colon, and then whatever the topic is. So I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, Kaicho Shinichi Tohe Sensei takes great pains to teach us so clearly where his goal, he says it again and again and again, and I just celebrate it, is if you can experience the difference in class, if you really know, are you keeping one point or almost keeping one point, you know, and he'll say lower, more calm more calm, lower. It's noticing the difference. And so take that training of noticing the difference. How are you seeing? What is even your field of vision? Are you stuck? Do you have tunnel vision? Or 
can you feel that your body is actually relaxed, that you're naturally keeping one point? Naturally, the weight is underside. Naturally, he is extending. You don't have to do it if you just get out of your own way. And it's really a challenge when you're trying to get out of your own way and put the needs of others first. But it's a great, it's a great training vehicle because you, you have to. It kind of forces you to say, look, this is not about me. Empty your cup and use that expanded vision to get the assistance you need for whatever comes up. Just like in that Psychon reading, um, only when an event occurs, a person begins to work. You're waiting. That, that's the patience that Freiling Sensei was referencing. You're allowing the world to come to you and responding in kind. And therefore, you, there's no opportunity for you to have dust on your mirror or you'll be late. Um, Toy Sensei would say, move on the E of Ima. Ima just means now or move on the N of now or whatever your language is. It means don't be late. Um, so in any event, um, uh, Freiling Sensei, thank you very much for taking the time to prepare this for us all. It was uh, uh, wonderfully done. And uh, I'm just looking here on the screen. It's so great to see all of your faces from so many places uh, all over the world. Uh, it's it, on all these different time zones. So <laughs> yeah, eager. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all. I appreciate it. Uh, domo arigatou gozaimashita.